one of the most commonly cited reasons that people claim they do not believe in God is the so-called problem of pain or suffering. This idea that if God is good and He is powerful, why is there evil and pain and suffering in the world? Uh, I was reading recently uh, a dialogue between two very well-known individuals in the religious world, uh, and one of them is a man by the name of Bart Ehrman. He's become a very vocal critic of Christianity in general, of the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. And in this dialogue from 2008, he describes a process by which he moved from a, a self-proclaimed evangelical Christian to an agnostic. And he said, how can one explain all the pain and misery in the world if God, the creator and redeemer of all, is sovereign over it? Why, I asked, is there such rampant starvation in the world? Why are there droughts, epidemics, hurricanes, and earthquakes? If God is concerned to answer my little prayers about my daily life, why didn't he answer my and others' big prayers when millions were being slaughtered by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia? When a mudslide killed 30,000 Colombians in their sleep in a matter of minutes. When disasters of all kinds caused by humans and by nature happened in the world. Now it's one thing to talk about suffering in Cambodia or Colombia or even California. But it's another thing to talk about suffering in our own lives. Because we've all known some measure of suffering. We've all experienced a lack of, of health or of comfort or of even a loss of life that brings us pain and sorrow. If I were suffering and saw no end to that suffering, would I still believe in God? That is the situation of the psalmist in Psalm 88. It has been called the most mournful of the psalms. Psalm 88 is a psalm of lament. And we have a number of these in the book of Psalms. And they tend to follow a certain structure, a certain order. And they begin with a cry of a prayer to God and then a list of these things that the psalmist is concerned about that are bringing the psalmist pain and suffering and doubt. But all of the psalms of lament end with an expression of hope and faith except Psalm 88. Psalm 88 does not have a verse at the end that says, I know God will save me. I know that God's salvation is here. I know that it, it doesn't have it. We say, well, why would God include in His book Psalm 88? A psalm that is sad. A psalm that expresses great pain and has no hope no silver lining at the end. And I would suggest that it's included in God's book because that is the reality that some people are living. There are people in this world who are experiencing pain and suffering and sorrow and they have no sign of hope. And so I want to look at Psalm 88 with you but there's something else peculiar that takes place in this psalm. Three times, the psalmist expresses his faith by praying to God. And I don't know if the psalmist intended to divide his psalm according to those three expressions of prayer, but that's the way that we're going to look at the psalm together this morning. And I'm getting ready to click, and I don't have a slide. So, I'm just in the habit. 
First of all, I want you to see in verses 1 through 9, sometimes God's people suffer. Sometimes God's people suffer. The psalmist says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to hear my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Now we're going to stop in the middle of verse 9. I want you to notice three things in verses 1 through 9. First of all, the psalmist offers a prayer of faith. In fact, as we look at verse 1, we see that the psalmist calls upon God as the Lord. He uses the covenant name of God. Now, if you back up for a moment to the title of this psalm, and we don't know if the titles are inspired, uh, but it is attributed to Heman the Ezraite. Heman the Ezraite. If you flip over in your Bible to Psalm 89, you will see that it is written by Ethan the Ezraite. Now what's interesting is, if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 3, and 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6, we find Heman and Ethan both listed in those verses. They are the grandsons of Judah and Tamar. And it is said that Ethan is one of the wisest. He is wiser than Solomon uh, in 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 6. And so these are people of faith. Heman is, is not a random stranger. He's a descendant of Judah, who is the grandson of Abraham. He is one who is a recipient of the covenant promise of God. And so he calls God by his covenant name. And he says, God is my salvation. So this is not a prayer of rebellion. This is a prayer of faith. And then you look at verse 2. And it looks almost exactly like Psalm 86 verse 1. Which says, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. Which is in fact a prayer of David. And so it's very evident in the way that this man prays that he has a true and lasting faith in God. And yet, when we get to verses 3 through 5, we see he is in a very dire situation. He talks about Sheol and the pit and the grave. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the term Sheol, it is the term for the realm, the place of the dead in the Old Testament. And according to the prevailing ideas in the Old Testament period, this is the place where the dead go. It's, they didn't talk about a heaven and a hell. They didn't talk about a paradise or a waiting place. They talked about Sheol. And in fact, you could draw a diagram. I remember very, very specifically one of my professors of Old Testament who studied at Hebrew University in Cincinnati drawing this picture of how they believed that this shadowy place was under the ocean. And so the people go and they're not quite fully existent there. They're not quite gone from existence, but they don't have a full, it, it would almost be like what we think of as a ghost, a shadowy existence below the earth. That's Sheol. And the word pit and the word grave in the context of this psalm are synonyms. And so what the psalmist says is, I'm as good as dead. He says, you have put me in the pit. You have counted me as one who has gone down like one set loose among the dead. And so he says of God, look, I might as well be dead for all the help I'm getting from you. And then he gets even more personal because in verses 6 through 9, he places the blame on God. He says, you have put me in the depths. Your wrath is upon me. You have caused my companions to shun me. Now, it's, I find it interesting 
And it's easy to point fingers, but when we think for a moment about suffering, we've probably identified uh, with the situation of the psalmist. But people tend to go to two extremes when they're dealing with great pain and suffering. On the one extreme, when dealing with pain and suffering, people are looking for someone to blame, and ultimately they place the blame upon God. And they say, God has done this evil. He has done this wrongful thing to me. And it's true that in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning around verse 3 and going through verse 11, the author of Hebrews teaches us that God disciplines us, he trains us through suffering. And so sometimes when we suffer, God has a hand in that suffering. But if you go to James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, James says, when we're suffering, Let's not be tempted to say God is tempting me with evil because God does no evil and he does not tempt anyone with evil. And so there's this one extreme that says when I'm suffering, God is responsible. He has perpetrated, he has planned and executed evil against me. We've got to avoid that extreme. While acknowledging that God is powerful, we cannot say God has caused evil to happen against us. Then there's this other extreme I mentioned it a few weeks ago in the sermon on the glory of the cross. And it says God can't stop the pain and suffering that we experience. He doesn't have the power. It's not within his ability to take away our suffering. And certainly there are those who have drawn that conclusion and have ultimately come to the conclusion not only God can't do it, but he's not really there at all because of suffering. And while it's true that sometimes God does not intervene to stop our suffering, it is also true that he will eventually make all things right. Well, that sounds kind of like a non-answer. But as we dive further into the scripture, I believe it's the best answer that we have. And so first of all, we see sometimes God's people suffer. Uh, A man by the name of Oswald Chambers wrote quite a few Uh, uh, books in his lifetime. I recently got a copy of his complete works, over 1,500 pages. And in his book on discipline, Christian discipline, he says, suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, and of the Son of God. Each one ends in the cross. The bad thief is crucified, the penitent thief is crucified, and the Son of God is is crucified. By these signs we know the widespread heritage of suffering. Suffering comes to all people, including God's people. Now when you're reading this psalm, I don't know about you, I can't help but think about Job. Job 1.1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. You can't find a person in the Old Testament who is described in such a way. He is given the most righteous description of any man in the Old Testament, and yet we know that he suffered greatly. And so it would be wrong for us to say that we suffer because of some wrong that we've done. That we suffer because we've earned it. Now it's certainly true that when we sin, we can bring consequences and suffering upon ourselves. But suffering in and of itself is not a proof that we have done some wrong, that we we have earned our suffering in some way. In fact, on the contrary, the Son of God was completely sinless and he suffered. But do you know what happens? Sometimes we see someone who's suffering And even though we might not say it out loud, we have an assumption in the back of our minds that they've done some wrong to deserve it. Because if we aren't suffering, if things are going well for us, don't we tend to think, well, I must be doing something right if life is going well for me? You know, I remember sitting uh, with um, a friend and saying, I have this idea that if I will follow God and I will obey Him, the right opportunities will come up for me. But you know, that's not necessarily true. Just like if we suffer, it's not necessarily true that we've done some wrong. I think that especially when we talk about people who have mental or emotional problems, 
it's easy for us to judge and say, well, that, that person who has depression or that person who has bipolar disorder, they must not have enough faith. But that's not necessarily true. Just because we're suffering doesn't mean that we've done something to cause that suffering, to bring that suffering upon ourselves. And this is an example. The psalmist is an example of this. And so first of all, we see in verses 1 through 9 that sometimes God's people suffer. As we move into the last part of verse 9 and through verse 12, we see second of all, sometimes suffering feels bigger than God. The psalmist says, Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your works known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Now, the psalmist is continuing two things here. He continues his prayer. He says, every day I call upon you. Wouldn't it have been easy for the psalmist in his situation to quit praying? To give up and say, this prayer isn't doing anything. I'm headed for my deathbed. I'm shunned. I'm in pain. And forget it. I'm going to quit praying because it's not doing any good. But he continues to pray. But he also continues to say, I might as well be dead. He describes uh, with these questions his doubts. Saying, God is treating me as though I've already died because he's not answering my prayers. The word Abaddon in verse 11 uh, means destruction and is once again uh, similar to uh, the word for grave or sheol in these verses. The psalmist feels like God is not there for him. Doesn't suffering have a way of making us feel like God doesn't care? And that he's not there for us. When we are experiencing a great trial, when something dramatic and terrible happens to us or to someone we know, it is all too easy for us to feel like that suffering is greater than God. Because it's in our face. And we're saying, where's God in all of this? But you know, that's what the devil wants us to feel. He wants us to feel despair. He wants to starve us of hope and make us feel like God can't or won't intervene on our behalf. I'm reminded of uh, something that's described in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 is very dramatic in the highs and the lows that you see. In the first part of the chapter, Jesus has gone up onto the Mount of Transfiguration with his inner circle. And while he is on the Mount of Transfiguration, in Mark chapter 9 and verse 14, we read, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them. They've come down now from the mountain. And the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, that is Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Now I want to put a pause right there for just a moment. And think about this man and his son. Because later we read, this has been going on for all of the boy's life. For all of his life, this father has watched his son experience this demon possession. He's thrown into water and into fire. And I don't know if you can imagine that. I cannot imagine my child being possessed, being hurt in a way that I had absolutely no control over it. There was absolutely nothing I can do. And so this father finally has a glimpse of hope when he hears about this man, Jesus. And this man, Jesus, is going throughout Galilee, and he's healing people. He's touching children and taking away their ailments. And so finally, there is a glimmer of hope. And he goes and he finds these disciples. <laughs> it's not like a concert. It's not like Jesus says, we're going to be in Nazareth on this date, and Capernaum on this date, and Bethany on this date. You understand, there was no text messaging. There was no internet. 
He had to search by word of mouth and hope that he got the timing right. And he finally finds Jesus and his disciples, except Jesus isn't there. And so he tries the disciples. Maybe they can heal my son. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. How do you think that made him feel? That's the way the devil wants us to feel. But listen to what happens. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Did you hear that? If you can do anything. He's lost hope. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. The devil wants us to feel like suffering is bigger than God. But in reality, it is not. Yet, we have to cling to a hope that we may not see in this life. You remember that Adam read for us from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And he says, Peter says, this suffering is going to last for a little while, but God is going to comfort, strengthen, and establish you. The problem is, we don't necessarily know when that will be. And so it's easy for us to look at the suffering and feel like God is bigger. But you know, in spite of all of this, as we go to the conclusion of the psalm, we see even now the psalmist does not cease praying. Sometimes God's people suffer. Sometimes suffering feels bigger than God. And sometimes we suffer and we don't know why. He says, but I, O Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I read a number of different resources in studying Psalm 88. And there were different ways that these commentators tried to explain what's taking place in this psalm. There's some who go back and they say, well, here's this man, Heman the Ezraite, and he... He is responsible, although you can't find it in the book of Psalms, he is responsible, he must have been responsible for writing some of the greatest hymns. You know, maybe you've heard the story about the song, How Great Thou Art, and the man who lost his family, and then he wrote that song. And that's sort of the angle that this commentator was taking on Psalm 88. Another commentator says, well, you know, he got what he deserved because he doesn't have enough faith. He doesn't trust in God. And so at the end, his only companion is darkness. I, I don't really see either one of those being the point of this psalm. I see that even in spite of his doubts, the psalmist continues to pray in verse 13. The fact is, sometimes we don't know why we suffer, but we keep on praying anyway. Uh, Paul Miller wrote a book called A Praying Life, and he says prayer is helplessness. He wrote, God wants us to come to him empty-handed, weary, and heavy laden. Instinctively, we want to get rid of our helplessness. The very thing that we are allergic to, our helplessness, is what makes prayer work. W.H. Bellinger wrote a book on the Psalms, and he says, expressing pain 
is part of the psalm's honest dialogue of faith. The fact is, we don't always get the answers we want. But prayer is not about getting answers. It is about accepting the will of God when we don't understand. And the psalmist continues to pray even though he doesn't understand. Why? He asks an age-old question, but I want you to notice, even as he asks why, he's not asking it of the philosophers of the age. He's not asking it of the priest. He's asking God why. He's expressing his pain and his lack of understanding to God. And you remember, once again, Job, who was very forthright and and came very close, if not uh, actually rebelled against God at some point. But in the end, in the grand scheme of all that he says at the conclusion of the book of Job, God says that Job has spoken rightly. Why? Because he didn't take his concerns to his friends. He didn't take his concerns to his wife. He took his concerns to God. And so we may not ever get an answer to why. And that's really, really hard. It's easy for me to say, I'm not suffering. But even when we don't know why, we know who loves us. Now, I love uh, Luke chapter 18, but it's also kind of frightening when you look at it. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. Now let me stop for just a moment. Generally speaking, when we deal with suffering and when we ask the question why, what we're trying to say is, God, this isn't fair. I don't understand why I'm suffering because I didn't do anything to earn this suffering. And so we're actually asking, where is the justice? And so this widow says, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, the judge refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Now that's what I'm talking about. If I'm feeling suffering, if I'm feeling like my pain is not just, is not fair, Jesus says, God's going to be there pretty quick. But then listen to what he says at the end of verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, what does that have to do with what he just said? Well, two things. When's he going to give the justice? When he comes back and sets all things to rights. Now, wait a minute. I thought you said he was coming fast. This life is a vapor. The the period of time that we experience is but a blip on the dot of the vast expanse of eternity. So yes, he's going to come back. He's going to come back fast. We don't know the day or the hour. He's going to set all things to rights. But listen to this as well. Will he find faith on earth? Jesus says, your primary concern is not whether or not things are just, but whether or not you've been made just. Will he find faith? How are we justified? By faith in him. We can rail at the injustice in the world all day long. But if when the Son of Man returns, we have not been made just, it will be all for naught. And so the question is, when the Son of Man comes, not will He bring justice, but will you be one of His just ones? By faith. Now, once again, that's easy for me to say. Because when we're suffering, we don't want to hear that. We want to hear, God's going to alleviate your suffering. Sometimes He will and sometimes He won't. We don't know why. It's not for us to know why. 
And that's the hardest thing because we want to know. We want to give a reason. We want to have someone or something to blame when we suffer. But God's answer is, I will make it right in my time. And will you be right with me? When I was looking at what I was going to preach this week, I was trying to get back to our theme for the year. We've been away from it because of uh, holidays and vacation Bible school. and I didn't put it on the screen, but Psalm 7711 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. And we've done a number of things with that this year. And this, I think, is, is what, I'm, what I've called a forgotten doctrine. The doctrine of suffering. That suffering is not meant necessarily, it can be used to make us better, but sometimes suffering is just suffering. Sometimes suffering isn't fair, it's never fun, and sometimes we don't know why we suffer. But what I see in Psalm 88 is a person of faith who prays even though he's suffering. Is a person of faith who prays even though at times he feels like his suffering is bigger than God. And a person of faith who prays even when he doesn't know why he's suffering. The prayer of faith will sustain us in suffering even if that suffering remains. And one day, God will put all things right. And if we by faith are right with Him, we will know no suffering. How do I get right with Him? Through Jesus Christ. If I believe that He is the Christ, turn away from sin and confess His name, and am baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, God makes me right through the blood of Jesus Christ. And whatever I may suffer in this life cannot even begin to compare with the joy that I will experience in His presence. And along the way, the prayer of faith can sustain me through whatever I face. Maybe you need that hope this morning. We're going to sing an invitation song, and you're invited to come as we stand and sing.